Yeah, thanks, huh? Thanks. Hey, if I can get everybody to get seated, I just kind of found out that Bob's plane's leaving a little sooner than we thought, so grab a seat real quick. Everybody excited? Oh my gosh, there's more excitement at a golf game. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. This is a great day. We are celebrating the love of God. We're celebrating His goodness. We're celebrating His grace. This is a very exciting moment in time, man. I am telling you, we're at the end of a, of a, of a three-month amplified intentional pursuit. And I, I got to tell you, man, this pursuit has meant the world to me. Thank you for pursuing God with us. Thank you for being God chasers. I honestly believe that God is raising up some people that are, uh, that are, ch that are world changers, that are changing the world. We might not change the big world, but we can change the world where we live. And I really believe that's happening. There's a real impact that's taking place, and good, good stuff is going on. I'm not going to delay. I'm just going to go right into this. I'm excited about this. Uh, I'll be sharing with you next week some things. I'm actually preaching it's a bad day for the devil next week. I'm very excited about that. I just feel like, oh, because we're getting our identity. We're getting this thing right. We're in pursuit of the king of glory, and God's, God's moving. Uh, can't encourage you enough, man. Spend the day. Get to know your church family a little stronger, a little longer, a little better. Uh, in line of everything that I've just said, and because uh, we want to respect, uh, we want to respect Bob and 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 his his time. I want to get him up here as quickly as we can. He does have a plane leaving at two, which means he's got to be at Harrisburg a little bit after one. Uh, so uh, we we've, we've kind of going to have to expedite him out whenever it's over. Uh, but man, I love this guy. Thank God for him. Some of you have not had the privilege of being in service with Bob as he's shared in the past. But i got to tell you something, man. He's making an impact internationally. And God's using him, raising him up. Uh, I, I really feel like he's a person who hears very, very clearly from the Lord. Jasmine, can you stand real quick? I just need to ask you a question. Was the word from Larry right on last week? Yeah. Okay. It was right on and amazing and absolutely fantastic. And I was teaching in mentoring class, thanks, dear, uh, from, from that, out of that, the, our ability to hear God and, and what's available, the ability to hear. She had such a, a strong word, and it, it dealt with David when he was still in her womb and some of the different things that had happened there. And all of it was just so correct. And I actually checked into it to find out and, and got the word that everything was so clear. But in that, it's our ability to hear God that's absolutely amazing. And we're praying and asking God for a sensitivity and the magnification of that ability that we can hear clearly from him and respond to what he's speaking, saying, and doing. So I know that's Bob's heart. He teaches that all across the world. He has opportunity for that. Going to be doing some web stuff this year, some webinars and some different things. Couldn't encourage you enough to get that prophetic training. God's doing some pretty cool stuff in that. Uh, so we're excited. It's a very, very great privilege to have him with us. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Bob Hazlett, he has, uh, like I said, he travels uh, in the Power and Love meetings every month with uh, Pastor Dan and, and Todd and has the opportunity of sharing uh, together with them and Tom Rotolo, and that's a great ministry. They've just wound up the last uh, the last night up at uh, Christ Community Church. Very powerful session. I uh, just had a, one of the guys come and tell me his wife went for the whole thing, and she's absolutely the person who came home Saturday is not the person who went Tuesday uh, because it's life-changing, because it's transforming, and lives are being changed and transformed, and we get to see the Lord just doing amazing things. So I thank the Lord for this young man. Would you please make Bob Hazlett welcome in the house? Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank the Lord. Thank you, man. Thank you. Can I get you anything? You're good? I'll get you another one. Yeah, that'd be good. I'll lose one up here. I'm good. Good morning. Well, you guys have a great day of celebration. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you, Pastor Don, for having us. And, and it's honoring to be here on your 15th anniversary as a church in 30, is that 30 years of marriage or 30 years of ministry? Ministry, wow. You've been long, married longer than that? Wow, 33. You know that's when Jesus died. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus was also resurrected. That was awesome. That's really good. <laughs> when I turned 33, someone told me that. They said, that's the year Jesus died. I said, yeah, that's the year Jesus was resurrected too. Huh? Come on. It, and if the king of glory knew, he, I mean, the, if, the, if the, the rulers of this age would have known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So that was a big mistake to mess around with Jesus, right? The devil could take back the cross. He'd do that in a heartbeat. So, uh, you know, if he could take back some of the things he's done against you, he'd probably take them back too because he didn't know they were going to make you stronger. He didn't know you were going to come back, right? So that's, a, you're the, that's, that's, that's an awesome thing. Well, it's really a privilege to be here, and, and I actually do have a – I'm really glad to be here. It's kind of a family day. You know, I know you guys are going to eat a lot of hot dogs and dunk a lot of people in the water, and I don't know what else you got planned on jumping around. 
But uh, I'm going to get on an airplane, fly back and see my family. But uh, I really was just during the worship, the Lord just spoke some things to me for you guys. And uh, I'm going to share that with you. And it's just been a, a wonderful time. I just came back uh, a couple of weeks ago. And as Pastor Don said, I get the great opportunity to hang around with Dan and Todd. And uh, we do these uh, trainings probably nine or ten times a year. Uh, but we all have our own uh, things that we do on our own as well. And I just got back um, about a week and a half ago from Brazil where I was there. Uh, Randy Clark had been there and trained about 125 young people, him and his team. And I came down the second week and we did a conference there uh, with one of the largest uh, networks there in Brazil. We did a, a youth and young adult conference for about two or 3,000 young people there. And it was, a, it was a great conference. And then those youth power invasion young people became the uh, ministry teams. And my kids got to jump in. I took my whole family down and uh, it was great. My kids got to jump in. I thought, you know, my kids taking them down to Brazil, the, you know, we could, we could be, have, you know, we had the green room in the back and there's worship teams. You know, there's a worship team, a worship leader from Bethel, Jeremy Riddle, and they love him. And, and we thought, well, they're just going to want to hang out with us. We, we got them there and we didn't see them for a week. I mean, they didn't, we're like, you want to come to the green room, meet Jeremy Riddle? No, we want to go to the prophecy rooms and prophesy over people. They thought, they thought that was better to, to, to give than receive. Isn't that strange for teenagers? <laughs> this generation, I just don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> so they had a great time there for a week praying for the sick and prophesying in the prophecy room. They, they had 125 uh, young people that, that uh, Randy and the team had trained, and they prophesied over about 3,000 Brazilian young people over that week, and it was just tremendous. My kids came back with stories. I just wept every, every night as they came back with stories, and then the last two two nights. They, they were having so much fun. They didn't even come to our room and tell us the stories. They just were so tired they went to bed. So we had to wait till on the plane ride home to hear a little bit more. And we got off the plane in New York City. And uh, my kids were in the back of the plane the last flight. And we got off the plane in New York City. And they said, we got a chance to pray for a guy in, a, in the back seat. And we were, we were, I was telling them, did you, I, asked, I was asking them, did you get any sleep? Because we had a 10-hour flight uh, from Brazil to New York. And, and I said, did you get any sleep? They said, no, we were talking to this guy from Spain. And he told us about he had hurt his knee. And we prayed for him. And he got healed. And, and I'm thinking, man, all I did was sleep. I feel a little bit bad. <laughs> it's a new generation, man. we got to keep up with them, Don, huh? Isn't it awesome? They're running. In. So we had a great time, and you know, I just want to encourage you. God's doing things in the nations. Um, I had a really interesting thing. You know, you have to you have to really realize, you know, that God God looks at the world from a different perspective than we do. And a lot of people look at the situations of that we're in in this world, the elections, the economy, and and they see a perspective and they don't have any hope. But let me tell you something: God doesn't view the world from the perspective of Fox News or CNN, or thank God, MSNBC, no, not at all. <laughs> he doesn't see it that way at all. He sees it from the perspective of heaven. And we need to see it from the perspective of heaven. We need to see the last 15 years from the perspective of heaven and the next 15 years, the last 30 years and the next 30 years, because God always looks at it with good news. He's always got good news in mind. I was uh, worshiping one night there in Brazil. The, the worship team was singing. I was just laying on the platform. I was getting ready to speak, and I had a strange picture, but the Lord started to speak to me. He started to speak to me about the nation of Brazil, and he, and, uh, he said, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to do something in the legislative process. There's going to be a, a legislative law that's going to try to be passed to legalize abortion in the nation, but I'm going to raise up judges that will, that will speak up for truth, and, that, and this will be a nation that will stand up for the right and the life of the unborn. Now, that was a strange thing for me to hear because, you know, in our nation, it's, it's, abortion is very accessible. So I thought, well, isn't it legal already in Brazil? I actually questioned the Lord on it because I didn't know. I didn't know anything about uh, the laws of that nation, but I got up and I shared that and people kind of cheered you know they're like wow there was a response that that God was going to raise up a generation uh, and a nation that would stand up for the rights and the life of the unborn well what I found out in late that next day I came in uh, in fact I, I I actually questioned it I went to sleep that night and I woke up the next morning and I decided I better research this so I started googling it and I found out that uh, uh, actually Brazil is one of the only nations in the western hemisphere that actually outlaws abortion. You can't get an abortion there. You couldn't get an abortion there without actually going to the Supreme Court of the nation. And only in cases of extreme cases uh, of, uh, of the physical, uh, the, the baby was missing a brain or if, if uh, there was uh, other situations. And so um, I came in and uh, the, the pastor, a couple pastors met me and they said, we want to talk to you about that word you gave. I said, yeah. They said, did you know 
uh, that last night there were some people from the ju judicial system here because we were in the capital city of Brazil. And so people from the government were at the conference and they heard that. And one of them just leapt because just three months before that, the, for the first time, the Supreme Court of Brazil actually allowed for abortions. There was a, they, they couldn't get it through the legislature. They tried many times. But so they tried to bypass the legislature, bring it to the Supreme Court. And there was, it's, it was a very uh, strong outcry from the churches and praying that God would reverse this decision. And they said just two days before this conference started, there was a changing of the flag in the capital of the nation of Brazil. And right in the Capitol Plaza, there's the, the presidential palace, there's the, the congressional palace, and then there's the Supreme Court building all together in that same square. And as they were changing the flag, they'd always do a flyover of an airplane. And they said that the airplane, the jet that flew over, flew too low when it flew past the Supreme Court building, and it blew all the windows out of the Supreme Court building. So they said the actual day this conference started, they were actually replacing all the windows of the Supreme Court building because I said that God was going to take off the blindfold off of the Supreme Court and he was going to give them new vision. And they started, so the, so the guy that was there from the judicial system was so excited. There were a couple senators that were there and they were so excited because this is a thing that's, that they were concerned about their nation for. And, um, Another thing that happened was last year when I was there, there was a, uh, just a, a one night where the Lord spoke to me that God wanted to raise up a new generation of Christian leaders. And I saw God raising up a Christian woman uh, that, would, that God would bring into the, to, the, to be leader of the nation of Brazil, president, a woman. And in the next election, there would be two women running off in the election. And, and uh, they actually emailed me a month before the conference and said, remember last year what you prophesied? Well, the woman that ran last time, the Christian woman that ran the last election, uh, that didn't that didn't win. She came in third. She's going to run again, and she's going to be at the conference. And we're gonna we're gonna pray with her. And we're gonna pray for her. And let me tell you something that I want you to I want you to take this, and I want you to I want you to think about our nation, about the nations that God sent you to, about your family, about your life. When you start to think and you start to see things from God's perspective, it may look like uh, our our nation is going one direction. But can I tell you something? God can turn the heart of a king, and God can dis depose and, and raise up new kings. That's what the Bible says. So God is still on his throne no matter what happens, no matter what the Supreme Court does, no matter what the government does. We have a authority and a right to vote, number one, but we have authority and a right to pray. And as long as we can see things from God's perspective. So just be encouraged. God is doing things in the nations. And he says, ask of me, I'll give the nations as an inheritance for you. Isn't that right? So I believe that God is raising up a, a mature church that can see the way he sees and speak what he speaks. And God is doing things in the nations, and it's my honor uh, to be able to, to go to places like that, but to be able to hang out with you guys, especially on a great family day like this. And so any party should have some gifts. So let me just give away some gifts, all right? Let's have some. I have this new um, prophetic school that I have. Oh, you're helping me out? All right. Anybody, since, since it's uh, like, uh, let's see, it's 15 years celebration of the church. Any 15-year-olds here? All right. Who, who turned 15 like this summer? Anybody? Yeah, all right, Rick. Yeah, I got you. You did? You turned 15 this summer? All right, sweet. We're going to give this to you. This is a prophetic school of four CDs. I teach this over at Global, uh, just how to hear the voice of God, how to, how to speak for God to other people, and how to remove hindrances in your life to hearing God's voice. And you're going to be an amazing voice of God for your generation. Bless you, young lady. Awesome. All right. How about, let's see. This is a CD my wife uh, made. It's called Heaven Made You. It's her, it, she made it for children, but I like to listen to it, too. In fact, uh, Pastor Dave over at the Christ Community Church told me last time I was there, he got it for his grandchild, uh, but uh, he, he listened to it first, and actually he had, hadn't been sleeping very well for a couple weeks, and it helped him to sleep better. So now he listens to it, and he got another one for his grandchild. So even grandpas like to listen to this, too. If, it, if you have trouble sleeping or if you need rest, it's just songs of, of, from the Father's heart and songs of peace. So anyone have a baby this summer? Anyone have a, a new baby? Yeah, a lot, you have a lot of babies in this. Can you go hand this to her over there? Awesome. God bless you. All right. Who has some prophetic words over your life or promises from God you're waiting to come to pass? And you're like, I want those now. Like, I want them right now. I want them, like, right now. I'm overdue. I've been pregnant for 12. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
This is called now is the time. It's actually how to bring your prophetic promises into the now because none of your promises in, in the kingdom, none of them are in the future. They're in the now because everything in the kingdom is now. Uh, geez, God, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. So it's two CDs teaching. Oh, my. Okay, give it to her. All right. Are you 30? I am, that, was gonna, that was my next thing. Are you 30? You look around 30, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. This is my wife's new worship CD. It's called Open the Door, and uh, it's, I just love it. I love listening to it. I have it on my iPad, uh, um, and I listen to it in my room. It's, uh, it's really songs of, of um, uh, intimacy with God with a little R&B style. My wife's this blonde-haired, blue-eyed pastor's daughter, but she sings like she's, you know, Latina or something. It's kind of funny. So she's got a little spice in it. I like it. Uh, your love and, and speak to me. Open the door. I will fly with you. So uh, who likes to just go into the secret place with the... Who likes to... Come on, brother. You got a little soul. I'm going to give this to you, all right? She's got a little... You're a little spicy guy. I'm going to give this to you, all right? Little R and B, little uh, spicy. There you go. God bless you guys, man. I'm so happy to be with you, and I'm so, I'm so, 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 um, kind of torn, you know, because I want to hang out with you guys and celebrate. I want to get Pastor Don in the dunking booth, man. I just, <laughs> I just wish I could do that, you know. Oh, I will make a huge donation to dunk Pastor Don. And <laughs> but unfortunately, I have an early flight, so I can't do that. So, but. Um, but, man, I have a really good word for you this, uh, today. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to just share with you something. I don't know how it's all going to come together. There's something about, you know, <clears throat> I'm the kind of person I always, always like to have things planned ahead. You know, I'm a, I'm a planner. I'm a thinker. I'm a strategizer. And then God calls me to a ministry where he's always calling audibles. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm like, that's my mindset. I'm, I, I kind of feel like a quarterback sometimes. You have to know all the plays, know how to run them, know what to do. You have, sometimes have to have them in your mind. But then when you get up to the line and God calls an audible, you just got to get ready to go. Like, go deep. <laughs> just go deep. I'll throw it. And that's the way I feel today. Let's just go deep. How about that? In fact, that's a good word. I was actually praying uh, during, the, during the worship. I'm like, Lord, what do you want to say to the church? And he said, I just tell him I just want to take them really deep in this next season. I want to take them deep. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes God wants to, to just rain on us, but sometimes he just wants to take us deep in a flood. You know, it's one thing to have a little outpouring. It's another thing just to go deep in the, in the presence of God. And I think God wants to take you deep. And um, I think that's the season that you're at in your life. You're going deeper. So take a look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and why not verse number 15, since it's, you know, your 15 year, and I'm a prophetic person, and everything has to kind of fit with numbers and that kind of stuff, all right? I had to get a 15 in there somewhere. I was trying to think, what am I going to talk about in 15? Maybe 3 times 5, that's 15, triple favor, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I feel like, I feel like the Lord's going to pull this together in a really neat way. So, all right, we're going to end with... For Ephesians 4.15, but let's start at verse number 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles and prophets and evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach the unity in faith and the knowledge of the Son and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves blown here and there, by every wind and teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up or grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Now listen to this. There's almost three stages he talks about here. All right? A lot of times we read this and we think, oh yeah, we're going to become mature. God, we need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and then we're going to be mature. That's not what it says. It says that God gives us these different gifts in the church for, so that he can equip us for the works of our service so that the body may be built up. So when you have all these gifts functioning, which I believe you have, I believe in the last 15 years, I believe that God has equipped your church. You're not lacking in, the, in the apostolic leadership. You're not lacking in prophetic uh, ministry. You're not lacking in evangelistic zeal. You're not lacking in discipleship teaching or pastoral care. You have these things in place, but that's not what makes you mature. Actually, what 
actually those gifts are given to you so that you may be equipped so that you can build one another up. That's what it says, so that you can be equipped so then that you build up the body. I believe you're at that place. I believe you've learned the importance of body ministry. You've learned the importance of leadership and different gifts in the church so that they can equip you so then you can build up, be built up in body ministry. But that's not full maturity. There's another level of maturity. Here's what it says. Until, verse 13, we reach the unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Those are two things that make us mature, right? Becoming mature. And, and, and I think that sometimes in organizational structures, we think it's the unity of faith that's what makes us mature. Can I tell you, you can have a unity in faith and still be immature. You can all believe the same thing and it all still be wrong. <laughs> You can all believe that, you know, everybody can tell you this is the direction you're supposed to go, but the person with the GPS is going to be right. And I believe that there's sometimes an organizational structure. We think maturity is, well, let's just all agree. But actually, here's what it says. It says that where you become mature is that you reach unity in your faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. That means that knowing God, knowing Christ, knowing Jesus is actually what gets you on the same page. Not believing, well, you know, what some person believes, you know, speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Another person says, well, just being filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit, whether you speak in tongues or not. And there's some churches, they divide themselves over that one issue. That one issue is enough to make us be divided. So we create something called denominations. Know what it means? To divide, denom, to divide nations. And Jesus says, you're not mature when you divide yourself. You're mature when you, re re when you reach unity. That's why I like that this is a church where people have come from all kinds of different backgrounds. We got Pentecostals. We got Bapticostals. We got Methocostals. We got Eucalyptus. We got Mentholyptus. We got all kinds of things. We got Catholicostals and Catholic Methodists and I don't know. <laughs> we got all kinds of people. Why? Because Unity doesn't come from uniformity. It comes from knowing Christ. It comes from knowing the Son. And that's where maturity comes. And that's what it says. So God gives you fullness of gifts in the church so then you can understand, wait a second, I'm be called to be a minister and to equip and build up the body. That's the first step of maturity. And then the second is, is that, hey, listen, I, we've got to come together on this. We've got to come together, and we've got to come together in the Son. It's like that old, you know, hymn of the church, come together right now over me you know that song I think it was number 333 in the hymnal in the <laughs> Methodist church come together right now right then look at verse 14 then we will no longer be infants isn't that awesome I think that's a day every pastor's been waiting for. Oh, God, I wish we were no longer infants. Well, wait a second. We need infants in the church. A family needs infants. It's just saying that the church is coming to maturity. We will no longer be tass tossed back and forth, blown by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people, their deceitfulness. Instead, here's verse 15, 15, and I believe this is a verse for you right now. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect in every respect mature body of him who is the head i believe that's where you're at why because actually in some cultures you know in our in our culture in the american culture you know we have a kind of passageways into uh, maturity you know what i mean there's certain times you know some people wait till they're 21 so they can have Coke, you know what I'm saying? Some people wait till they're, till they're 18 so they can, you know, go to college. Some people wait till they're 16 so they can get their driver's license. But there's some, there's some cultures where the passage from adulthood or from childhood to adulthood is more delineated. Like in our culture, we don't know what's an adult. I don't know. There's 35-year-olds living at home. Are they adults? I'm not sure. I'm just saying, if you live with your parents and you're 35, hmm, you're an adult child. Let's just say that, all right? <laughs> and I'm an, adult, I'm an adult child. And actually, I want my daughter to live with me till she's as long as she wants to because I want her in my home because I love her around. But here's what I'm saying is that there are some places and some cultures that they delineate the difference between childhood and adulthood in a different way. One of, those, one of those is the day we're celebrating today. You're 15. Do you know in the Latin American culture they have something called the quinceanera? You know what that means? It means you're 15. Happy birthday. You're 15. 
It's, and you're, you are turning 15. It's actually a passageway. It's kind of like the sweet 16, that, uh, the parties that we have, except like on steroids. I know this because I love 25% of the people in my home church are, are Latin American, you know? So I get a lot of good arroz con pollo, frijoles, a little bit of flan, you know? When I get to preach, I get a little santo hallelujah. You know, I just love it. I love the Latin American culture. I have, I have a special place in my heart for the Latin American culture because when I, I started taking Spanish in eighth grade, and the same year that I started taking Spanish, my, my parents started taking young people into our home, young adults. And a couple of the young adults that we took in, we had eight of them all at once, but two of them came from Cuba. The, the boat drop they had in the 80s, there was a couple of guys that came from Cuba. One of them, his name was Juan, Juan Diaz. He's still like a brother to me. My, my dad just a couple of weeks ago, or excuse me, a couple months ago down in Virginia, uh, did performed a wedding for his daughter. His daughter Jessica got married married, and my, my parents, she calls them grandma and grandpa, and uh, he used to, Juan used to call my, my parents, uh, he couldn't speak very good English, he called them mommy and daddy, that's what he called them, and he was older than me, but I, I, didn't, I never had an older brother, so he kind of became my older brother, you know, taught me all the things older brothers teach you, like, well, uh, how to swear in Spanish, that's what he taught me, sorry, because <laughs> I was the only one in, at the house that could speak any Spanish, I was taking my first year of Spanish in eighth grade, and so I became his interpreter, and I didn't realize the words he was teaching me were bad until I told my teacher them, and he, she's like, no, those aren't good words, don't, don't say those words. But Juan was like a brother to me for a while, you know, and, and uh, uh, we still kept, my family still kept uh, in touch with his family, but he used to say this to me, because I was always like kind of a, kind of a wise guy crack kind of a kid, and I was always kind of like, you know, I would always get a little hyper about stuff. He would always say, tranquilo, Bobby, tranquilo, Bobby. And I mean, he's Bob, you know, so he would call me Bobby, and tranquilo means chill out, basically, in Spanish. Tranquilo. And he, he taught me a, a lot about the uh, Latin American culture, guayaba. He taught me how to make Cuban coffee, uh, and, uh, of course, some of those choice um, spiritual words that we talked about earlier, you know. But I came to love the Latin American culture. God's, um, God's given me a, a love for the Latin American culture. I've been to about uh, 12 different uh, Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, 10% of my schedule is in Latin American churches. So I was in Miami. Uh, just a, a couple months ago at a church, and in the hotel I was in, they were having this huge, like, event. I thought it was a wedding, and I, and I saw all these people coming in with, you know, limousines and dresses and tuxedos and everything, and, and, and I said to the uh, person at the front desk, I said, oh, you have a wedding in the hotel? She goes, no, we have a quinceanera. I'm like, what's that? She said, that's a girl's turning 15 years old, and her parents are throwing her a party. I'm like, this is a party? She said, yeah. I said, this looks more like a, a wedding uh, reception, or it looks like a grad. I mean, it's huge. They do it huge. Because she said, yeah, because in our culture, we celebrate womanhood. We ce celebrate adulthood. We celebrate growing up. And I want to tell you something. I think there's something in the church that we need to learn, and we need to learn to celebrate maturity in people. We need to learn. The Bible says, honor your fathers and your mothers, and all will go well with you. There's something about growing up that's a powerful thing. And I want to tell you something. That I, I was reading about this this morning because I was thinking about you guys turning 15. I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? Listen to this. It's so cool what happens in a quinceanera. When they have a quinceanera, there's a certain, certain rituals and certain things that happen. And one of the things that happens is, is that they do um, a ritual of the changing of the shoe. And the father buys beautiful shoes, and I don't know, you know, for a girl. Now, that you're a church, so you say, well, what does that have to do with a 15-year-old girl? Well, the church is called a bride, right? You're a girl, so just be a girl for a second. All right, all you guys, just get over it. You're not an army anymore. You're just a girl right now, okay? All right? <laughs> Girly man. So... <laughs> So when she's 15 years old, they throw this huge celebration, and, and uh, the father buys these, the first high heel shoes. The girl gets the first high heel shoes she's ever had, and he takes off her, her uh, childish shoes, and he puts on these high heeled shoes, and it, it's a demonstration that she's going to walk like a woman now. And she has to learn to walk in, front, in high heels in front of everybody. I think it's kind of torturous, but to be honest with you, it's, it's kind of cool. So the church is getting some new shoes. How about that? God wants to give you some new shoes. Do you know the Bible says how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news to people? I believe this church is called to bring good news to this region. That's one of the, that's one of the, the it's part of the DNA inside of you. And some of you could sit back there and you can listen to Pastor Don go, it's an amazing day. It's a wonderful day. It's a great day, an amazing day in the house of God. And you could say, what did that guy have to drink for breakfast this morning? 
It's the joy of the Lord. It's not real. He's not, he, it's real. He's not putting it on. It's not fake. Because the, one of the, one of the, the destiny, DNA, uh, 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 destiny things over this church is to bring joy to this area, to bring good news to people that are in, that are in bad situations. And I believe when that, when that, what that means is that there's sometimes going to be a lot of people who need good news that are going to be drawn to you. And sometimes some of you feel like, how come all the people all with the problems come around me? Because you got the solution. You got the solution. You do. This is going to be a church. It's going to be a magnet for people with a lot of problems. It's going to be a church for people with a lot of issues. It's going to be a church that, that people come to that have a lot of needs. So guess what? You got a lot of backpacks to give out. Isn't that awesome? You have a lot of backpacks. And what does that mean? That God's going to give you what you need to give him out? He's going to give you the shoes that you need to go to the places. The other thing I heard God say about these shoes that he's given you, I heard God say, you've been wearing a set of shoes that's brought good news to this region, but he's called you to bring good news to the nations. Good news to the nations. And I saw him putting shoes on you as a church, and they were like shoes that had the flags of different nations on them. And I saw God preparing people to start to run through the nations. I heard God say, you're going to start to run through the nations on the Internet. And the nations that you've touched on the Internet are some of the nations that you're going to touch by feet. And I saw teams being co going from this church to different nations. I saw particularly Africa and South America. And then I saw Asia. And I saw some people going into Asia and bringing good news into third world countries in Asia. And I believe God is getting ready to fit some of you with the feet of the gospel of peace and to bring good news into places. There's some new shoes. Somebody, somebody say, I could use some new shoes. I guess I got a word. I was out somewhere. I was out. Uh, I had the great privilege in, in March to go out to Bethel uh, to Bill Johnson's church and, and to preach at a conference there. And, you know, um, I was teaching the second year class at Bethel school there one day. And uh, I was doing this prophetic exercise with them and had them pray over each other. And this guy comes up to me and he starts giving me this word. And it, every time, every once in a while, people come up and say, hey, I have a word for you. And I, I just get ready to receive it. Like, okay, I receive it. And usually it's encouraging, but I can't figure it out sometimes or whatever. So he comes up and he says, I see somebody giving you two, two, new pair of news, uh, two new pairs of shoes. And I'm not really a shoe guy. Like, I've always been like, give me one pair of shoes. One pair of sneakers, one pair of black shoes. That's all I need. Just, just They can slip easily on and off in the airport. They go with everything. Black goes with everything. You put it with gray. You put it with brown. You put it with everything. Whatever. And, and, uh, what, and he said, I see somebody giving you two new pair of shoes. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And he told me what they were for. He told me what they would represent. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty good. Do you know within just a couple months, somebody bought me a pair of cowboy boots? I never wanted cowboy boots before. I got some ostrich cowboy boots sitting in my closet right now. And I'm like, Lord, I need a place to wear some cowboy boots. So guess what? Next week I'm going to Denver to preach. I'm going to wear my ostrich cowboy boots in Denver. <laughs> you know, God will give you shoes for everywhere he's called you to go. Everywhere he's called you to go, he'll give you the right kind of shoes for. So if he's called you to go to the inner city, he can give you some banging shoes for the inner city. I mean, I'm serious. He can give you some shoes that are going to reach the gangbangers, that are reach the people on the inside. Someone said the, the other day at the Power and Love, they took a group of people and they went down into uh, Harrisburg and they went down and there were some homeless people there. They started ministering to them. And all of a sudden, all these homeless people started running at them. And he said, I just thought this is a new word. It's a bum rush. <laughs> that's a interesting phrase a bum rush in the spirit you know <laughs> homeless people running at you and they just got to minister to them and they these were young people like high school students and and I thought what an interesting group for God to send down to homeless people in Harrisburg I love that because it doesn't matter where you've come from if you've got the right shoes you can go anywhere right? God's going to give you some new shoes. Here's the second thing uh, that a dad does for his daughter uh, on, on the quinceanera is he gives her a pillow to kneel on. It's called a kneeling pillow. And they, they, actually, they, they actually kneel and they do a prayer. It's a religious ceremony. And I just heard God say, I'm going to give you, there's a, a new anointing for prayer that's coming over this, over this church. And I saw what it was. It was like this huge pillow. And it was actually, you weren't just kneeling and praying for the church. But when you prayed, you prayed for the region. And there was regional transformation that's going to take place as a result of prayer. And I feel like God's going to be, start to bring together uh, streams together in this area for prayer. There's going to even be meetings together in, in mass meetings of churches coming together for prayer and for worship that's going to change this area. Why? Because part of growing up, part of maturity, is the church coming together. The church. Do you know that the Bible talks about uh, the, 
uh, the foolish and the wise virgins. In Matthew 25, I think it is. There's virgins, and what they were is they're, they're young women who are going into adulthood that are preparing for marriage. They're called virgins because they've been, they've been held themselves and waited for themselves for marriage. And the Bible talks about uh, the foolish and the wise ones, and the, they both went and they were waiting for the bridegroom. But the ones that were wise were the ones who brought enough resources to wait till extra. They were wise enough to have extra oil for their lamps. They all brought their lamps, but the things that they thought would happen didn't happen quickly. The bridegroom waited, and so they were waiting there for a while, and they fell asleep. They all fell asleep. The wise ones and the foolish ones got tired. Do you know that you can become weary doing the wrong thing, or you can become weary in well-doing? Either way, you can get tired Ever things don't happen the way you thought that you, that you would do them. But what gives you extra strength is when you have the extra oil. And what gives you the extra oil is when you spent the extra time in prayer. And I believe that God has called some of you in the last season to spend extra time in prayer and extra time in his presence. Why is it? It's so that you have the strength whenever other people get weary in doing well, you have the strength. And whenever the bridegroom comes, you're ready and you say, okay, I'm ready to go now. I think that some of you feel like you're weary when God's just saying, no, I'm just getting ready to refill your lamp. I'm just getting ready to refill your lamp. And the reason why he can refill your lamp is because you had the pillow of intimacy. You had the pillow of prayer. You had the pillow of spending time in his presence. Because that's time well spent. That's when some people will say, why are we praying? We need to go do something. Well, praying is doing something. Well, why are we interceding? We, why, why are we spending time worshiping? We need to go do something. Well, worshiping is doing something. What's it doing? It's filling up your oil. It's filling up your oil. And this is going to be a church. You're not going to run out of oil. You're not going to be one of those foolish virgins. You're going to be one of those, those ones that are ready, that are prepared. And when God, when God says, it's time now, it's time. And I feel like you're going to go through a season of time where God's going to start, you're going to start to learn to live out of the excess. I feel like you've gone through a season of time where you've had just enough oil for each day. And it's like, oh, now oil's gone. What am I going to do? Oh, it's back again. And you're like, the miracle of the manna was great. But can I tell you something? It's way better to have abundance. And God's going to teach you to live off the excess. I believe that there's excess that's coming to you. And God's going to show you what to do with the excess. And it's good to have excess oil because you never know what's coming ahead. You never know how long the night's going to be. And there might be some other people who run out. So I believe that God has called you to this place of intimacy so that he can bring refreshing to you. The third thing that happens is in this um, thing, there's a third ritual uh, that happens with the father. First, he, he changes the shoes, and then what he does is he gives her this pillow. And the last thing is, this is an interesting thing. It's uh, how do you make this spiritual? But I saw it, and I thought, this is so true. They, the, they give the, the daughter, and she's 15 years old, they give her her last doll that she'll ever have as, as a child. And it's to remind her that there's always something childlike about her, even though she's going into adulthood. And I like that about God, because that's actually the way we grow in the kingdom. The way you keep growing in the kingdom is you stay like a child. The way you grow in the kingdom is, man, you just enjoy the things of God. And as soon as you become an expert, really, you stop growing, isn't it? So come on, grow up, but don't grow up too much. <laughs> we want you to become mature, but don't become so, so adult that you don't think you can grow. I want to enjoy the things of God no matter what age I'm in, right? And so, so turning 15 is a big thing for a woman going into adulthood. And listen to, listen to the gifts that are given to this woman. I don't even have to tell you what these represent. Placed on her head is a tiara when she's 15 years old, representing her royalty. Placed, placed around her neck is a cross, representing her faith and the work of Christ. Placed in her hand is a Bible, representing the principles of God that are going to guide her into adulthood. And placed in her other hand is a scepter, which represents the authority of adulthood. This all comes from a Secular ritual of passing from womanhood into adulthood. But this could be a ceremony we could do right now, and you could receive the word of the Lord because I believe that God is moving you into maturity. I believe God is saying to this church, grow up. In fact, he's saying, you're growing up, and I'm proud of you. There was actually certain ages in the Hebrew culture that were important for maturity. That one of the most important ages for a Hebrew young man and young woman, but young men especially, was the age 30. 
you know that 30 is an important age for Jesus, right? It was the day, the, the year that he was baptized. And he said, I have to be baptized because I have to fulfill all righteousness. And he honored John the Baptist. He honored the people that went before him. He honored those. And John the Baptist said, what are you, crazy? I mean, I'm not even worthy to tie your shoes. Why in the world would you? And it was because Jesus understood part of a maturity is demonstrating humility. Part of, part of growing in maturity is demonstrating humility. And I believe that these two things are tied together. The, 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 the phase of growth the church is in and Pastor Don's ministry, you're connected together because you're both coming into a new phase of maturity and, and authority and, and, kingdom, and kingdom understanding at the same time. And what a wonderful thing when God brings the whole church together, where we all grow together into the unity of the faith, right? And Pastor Don, I just, I, just, I just felt like the Lord was saying, this is an important year for your ministry and what God is doing. Because just as Jesus demonstrated um, humility, you've demonstrated humility because you've actually served other, other men's ministries. Men that you've mentioned them, men that you helped and that you raised up out of this church that you see running in places that you're not running right now, but you honor them, and that's humility. And I, hear, I, I kept hearing the Lord say today that this is a year where you've even kind of been hidden in some ways. That Jesus allowed himself to be baptized, to be hidden, but when he came out, what happened? The heavens opened, and they never shut up again. There's coming an open heaven over this house that will never shut up again. There's coming an open heaven over this house that will never... And then the Spirit came and descended, and it, and it landed, hovered over Jesus. It hovered on him. And I want to tell you, as we were worshiping, the picture that I saw. This is a picture that I saw. I, I was just kneeling on the ground, and I saw this tornado. And I thought, oh, Lord, you're going to give me one of those ap you know, ap apocalyptic words. There's a tornado coming. But this tornado came, and it rested over the church. But the church was like a pool of water. All I could saw, it was like water. And it, and it began to swirl around the water. And then I saw the water that was in the, in the pool go up into the funnel cloud, and it became this kind of funnel cloud over the water. And I remembered the scripture, Psalm 42, and I want to read it to you because I believe it's a, a passage for the season that you're in in this church and what God is bringing you into. In Psalm 42, David is in a time in his life where he's tired. Remember I talked about being tired, being weary and well-doing, but not running out of oil. He's in a place where he's tired, and he's a little bit weary. But listen to what he says. Psalm 42 is one of my favorite passages. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the, or under the covering of the Almighty One with shouts of joy and praise among festival throngs. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, the mount of, uh, from Mount Mizar, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and your breakers sweep over me. I want to tell you something. Uh, as David was crying out for God, he was saying, my soul thirsts for you, God. My soul cries out for you. My soul is down, downcast. I've become weary and well-doing. And as the deer pants for streams, that's the way my, my soul pants for you. So David was saying, I want a refreshing from you. I'm weary and I want to be refreshed like the deer goes to the water book, brooks and ref is refreshed. And here's the way that God answers him. He goes through this whole thing telling God the way he feels and saying, I just want a drink of water from you. And here's what God says. I'm going to answer you as you put your hope in me. And here's how he answers in verse number seven. As deep calls unto deep in the roar of your waterfall, all my waves and breakers will sweep over you. So you're thirsty for a drink from a stream, but I'm going to let you drink from a fire hose. That's what he says. This word waterfall, it says that as deep calls unto deep, I'm going to take you deeper. Go deep. Because I want to take you deeper. I want to take you. I want to take you farther. I want to take you from just being equipped 
to take you to building up. I want to take you from being built up to coming together. I want to take you from coming together to come to the fullness of the stature, the measure of Christ, so that you're not lacking in anything. I want you to come to full maturity. It's possible for you to be a mature church. It's possible for you to be a bride without spot, without wrinkle. How does it happen? It's when you get tired, when you're the wise virgin who you've had enough oil and you spent time in the presence of God, when deep calls unto deep. God doesn't want to just give you another outpouring. He wants to give you a water spout that never runs out. And actually this word for waterfalls, it's literally the word water spout. And what a water spout is, it's when a cloud hovers over water and the barometric pressure changes over that water. The pressure changes in the cloud. First, the pressure in the cloud changes the pressure in the water, and then the response of the water starts to change the cloud until they become one. And so the, water, the cloud comes over the water and hovers, and it draws the water into it. And once the water starts being drawn into the cloud, the cloud actually starts being drawn more to the water. So you had the, wa- the cloud coming to the water, which caused the water to draw to it, and after the water drawed to it, then the cloud draws to it and they become one. And it becomes a roar as deep calls unto deep. And sometimes what happens with a water spout is what's inside of the water is sucked up into the cloud. And then that tornado or that cloud moves and it moves to another area. And there's been times where they've been known like it's raining frogs. Where do the frogs come from? Or it's raining fish. And I don't know if it's ever rained meatballs, but my kids had a book like that. <laughs> but they, they come from the water whenever a water spout is formed over certain water. The, even the fish can be sucked up, and the things inside the water can be sucked up and dumped on the land. And that's exactly what God is doing for you. Where you feel like, man, God, I'm weary. I just need a refreshing drink of water. He's like, I'm not going to give you a stream. I'm going to give you a water hose. I'm going to give you a water spout. Deep starts to call into deep, and when deep responds to deep, then God starts to draw what's out of you, and then that cloud begins to move, and what's happening is, I saw this funnel cloud form over the church, and it started to draw out what was in the church. It started to draw out the gifts that are in you. It started to draw out the Christ that's in you, and you called out to God, and he called out to you, and then the roar of that waterfall started to to roar, and you began to respond to it, and then that water spout started to move. It started to move over York. It started to move over the county. It started to move over Pennsylvania. And God started to deposit what was inside of you. And he started to pour on this region. And I believe that God wants to give you not an outpouring. He wants to give you a, 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 a downspout. He doesn't want to give you a visitation. He wants to give you a habitation that transforms the area. Because when God hovers over you and draws you up to him, it's so that he can transform what's inside of you. So then he can transform what's around you. And if you look at this in the Bible, in Genesis, the the earth was dark and it was in chaos and it was in emptiness. And what was God's solution? He hovered over the waters. He hovered over the waters. The cloud came over the waters. And something happened when the cloud came over the waters that what was in the cloud got into the waters. What was in the cloud was drawn into the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And there was evening. There was morning. The first day. And creation came because God hovered over man. And because man responded to God and then transformation happened in the earth. And that's what's happening in this place is that God's been drawing you. And some of you don't even know. You're like, I don't know. I feel tired. Like I'm praying, but I don't feel anything. I had a great um, conversation with a young man the other night. I talked about perfect love casting out all fear. And I said at the end of our meeting, I said, just ask God for more love and expose any area of your life where you haven't received his love. Because if in an area of your life that you have fear, you haven't received his love. So a young man came up to me uh, later on that night or the next morning. I can't remember which it was. And he said, you know, in our group, we were praying after that meeting. And he said, I, I said, you know, I said to them, he said in this group, he said, I told my, my people that were praying with me, you know, I, I, I have a fear that I'm going to get so excited about the miracles of God that I'm going to forget about God. And I just want to pray that I won't forget to have intimacy with God in all these great miracles that I'm seeing him do in my life. Now, that's, how many know that's an honest prayer? You don't need to have fear of it because God doesn't want you to have fear of it, but he was being honest and genuine that I don't just want the miracles, I want God. I don't just want to desire the supernatural gifts. I want to desire God. 
And he was genuine about it. But he, here's what he said, what happened. He said, so they expressed the different things they wanted to grow in, and they began to pray. And he said the two, he was praying with two ladies, and they're just praying up a storm. They're just really into it. They're feeling the presence and the anointing of God. And he's standing there, and he's not feeling anything. And he's standing there. He's got his eyes open. He's looking at them, and he's like, what's wrong with me? I don't, there's no anointing in this prayer. What's wrong with this prayer? What's going on? So he comes, and he tells me, he said, why? What is wrong with me? Why, why didn't I feel any anointing? Did I, did I offend God by telling him that I was afraid that I wouldn't be intimate with him? I said, no, you pleased him. He answered your prayer. He said, what do you mean? You said you wanted to be intimate with him, not just because of what you do or what you feel. You wanted to be intimate with him because you love him. So he gave you the opportunity to not feel him. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> He's like, no, I know it's, it's not. <laughs> Because he wants you to know he loves you even when you don't feel it. He wants you to know he's hovering over you even when it feels like darkness, he's still hovering over you. Even when it feels like chaos, he's still hovering over you. Even when it feels like emptiness, he's still hovering over you. And he's going to keep hovering over you like a mother hovers over you. Just like he, he said in Exodus 25 to his people, you were in slavery, but I bore you up on eagle's wings and I covered you with my feathers and I brought you into a land that I promised to you. Just like he said to David and David confessed back in Psalm 91 that he who dwells under the covering in the secret place of the Most High God will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Shadows aren't good places. It's not a, it's not a place you really like to be unless it's raining it's nice to have a little covering or unless it's, there's bad uh, circumstances around you. And I, I want you to know whatever you're going through, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God will abide in the shadow. And I believe that God is drawing you deeper because he's drawing you to a place of maturity. He's drawing you to a place, maybe it's that, that you know he loves you even if you don't feel it. Or you know he still heals even when you don't see it for a moment. You, you, a place where you know that he has a plan for your life even when it doesn't look like it's going that way. And you know... Jesus had to know it because he was 30. He humbled himself. He was 30. He was baptized. He was 30. The sky opened. He was 30 and the dove came down. But he was 30 and the devil came to test him. Took him into a wilderness. And can I tell you something? When the heavens are open, the wilderness is a great place to be because it's not a place where the devil tests you. It's a place where you get to kick the devil's butt. You never see an example where the devil came back and even tried to talk to Jesus about those. If you really think you're the son of God, what? Are you kidding me? If I'm the son of God? You see, he tested him three times, but once he was tested, there was, there was, he couldn't test him in that area anymore. And I believe that there's some things, areas where God's saying, you know, there's areas you've been tested. You're not going to be able to even be tested. You're untestable in that area anymore. The devil can't even test you because he knows I'm not even going to mess with that. I'm not going to mess with that. I just feel like a fool messing with that. Now, there's other tests because there's other maturity. But I believe that this is a year that God is going to bring this church to maturity. Here's what I want to do. And I, and, I, and I wish I could stay. My heart is to pray for people. But I believe that there's, there's one person we're going to pray for, the church, that's turning 15 years old. And I'm just going to picture you, this little girl with a, a crown on her head, with new shoes that God's given you, a new a rod of authority, a new Bible, new understanding of the Word of God. But I just want every young person in this place that's 15, I want you to stand to your feet. I'm going to just speak over you. I'm going to speak over this church. And I just want to ask you, just reach your hand towards these young people right now. Father, two little girls over there, and maybe a young man or over there. God, thank you right now for what you're doing in this church. God, I thank you that they're moving from, from childhood, from infancy to adulthood, God. I thank you that we're reaching, the, going to the fullness of the measure of faith, and I thank you that these young ladies are like a prophetic sign of what you're doing in this church, a sign that you're bringing together cultures. I thank you that different cultures, they come from different backgrounds. I thank you, Father, that they're going to walk in purity. I thank you that the pure in heart will see God. I thank you they're going to go to the nations. I thank you, Father, that they're, you're putting your spirit inside of them, gifts inside of them. You're putting in their hand right now a rod of authority. You're putting in their hand Hand, a love for the word of God. You're putting in their hand a crown on their, on their head, a crown, and you're giving them new shoes, God. I thank you for beautiful shoes, for beautiful feet for your daughters. And Lord, we pray right now over this, over this generation, but also over this church. And I see, and I know there's several of you standing, but over these two girls in the front, I see like musical signs over you, and I see musical notes over the both of you. And I hear God say, this is a sign for the church, that there's coming a maturity in the worship. There's 
there's going to come a real maturity in the worship, and God has called the two of you in different ways uh, to be worshipers. I think I see one of you as a singer and one of you as a musician, but I see both of you as worshipers, and I feel like God's going to begin to mature the worship in this house, and I see a musical project that God's going to have you work on, a, mu- a CD music that's going to come out, and songs that are going to be written right from this church, a mature sound of worship. So God, I pray you release the mature songs that you've got in this church, God, that you release the songs of the Lord, God, and God, I even pray there's something about the connection with the Latin American culture with this church, and the reason I chose the Latin American culture. God, I thank you that you're going to begin to reach the Latin American culture in this region through this church. That you're going to re- re- reach the Latin American uh, communities in this area. And God, I thank you for that. And I see over that group in the back, I see uh, uh, I see like this uh, a teaching anointing over all three of you. I see an anointing for learning and discipling and teaching. And I feel like there's a coming of maturity. In fact, uh, there's a young girl over there on the left with the nice curly hair in the front there. What's your name, honey? Yep. Julia, I like that name, Julia. Julia, I see, I see like little children around you, and I see a love for children, especially babies, and I see you like picking up a baby that's crying and it gets quiet. God's given you a gift uh, to, to help to bring comfort to babies. There's also a healing gift in you, and there's a compassion gift to bring healing to people, and I see a real move of God that's coming in the church for, for young people, uh, even especially children. God's going to bring a move of God among the children, and there's going to come times where I see even the children coming to the front and laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. I see a move of God of healing, of words of knowledge for healing and healing miracles coming through the children's ministry uh, of this church because God is raising up children that are mature in the gifts of the Spirit, children that walk in the power of the Spirit, children that speak in the in the gifts of the Spirit. So God, I thank you for that. We bless these young women. And what's your uh, name there on the right there? Yep. Era? Kara, Kara, God, I, I see you like God's giving you kind of a, you got a quirky sense of humor. You know, God's just giving you, <laughs> like you can make people laugh really good. You know, I just thought, God, but also that there's also a seriousness about the things of God. And God wants you to know there's like things that are deep down inside of you that are serious about, them. there's things that you've hidden in your heart about the word of God that God's going to begin to bring out of you. And there's a teaching gift in you, not just for the word of God, but I also, also saw you with um, children that have trouble and difficulty learning. And I see a gift with special needs children uh, that's going to come over your life because things that will make other people want to cry, the only kind of, you'll be able to laugh and just have joy around them and make people smile. Uh, also feel like there's a, a missions anointing that's coming on your life. And I see, uh, I see you having the opportunity to go on a short-term missions trip. And even that you studying a language and saying, I don't know if I can do it. You can do it. And there's a language that's going to come on you and a gift to speak. I don't know if you're studying Spanish or something, but I hear you studying and speaking Spanish language. Uh, and uh, I see you teaching children that are Spanish and teaching them how to speak English words too. And they're going to love you because you're going to make them laugh, especially when you try to speak Spanish. They're going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really awesome. What's your name back there, girl? Megan? Is it Megan? Yeah, Megan. Megan, there's a sweetness about you. Um, there's like a, there's a, I see like a pen in your hand. I see a writing gift that God's going to give you. And then part of the word, remember I saw the word back there in teaching. There's part of the word is the word of God that comes out of us. And I believe one of the ways that God's going to speak to you is through, I see you journaling and journaling your inner feelings, but then God's going to journal back to you his inner feelings. And God wants you to know that, that Part of deep calling unto deep is the deep hidden things inside of you that some things that you think are hidden, God wants you to know there's nothing hidden from him and there's nothing he doesn't love about you. He loves even the hidden things and the things that you want to keep hidden. Uh, God says he wants to bring them out. He wants to bring the best out of you. Also, I feel like there's hidden musical gifts inside of you that God doesn't want to have hidden anymore and he wants to bring them out of you because he doesn't want you to criticize uh, the way that you do music or the way that you uh, worship him. He wants you to, he wants to hear Everything you do, what you consider mistakes and what you consider perfect, he wants to hear it all because he loves it all. Amen? Amen. Stand with me to your feet. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this generation, in this church. And Lord, just raise a hand toward Pastor Don and Lori. I thank you. We celebrate with them, God, what you've done in this church. God, it's amazing. God, it's amazing. He even expressed, how are we going to fill this place? And Lord, look what you're doing. But God, I thank you that eye has not seen and ear has not heard nor has it entered in the heart of man what God has in store for those who love him. And Pastor Don, of all the, the scriptures I was reading about today, one that stuck out to me for you 
was from Genesis chapter 41, verse 46. And when Joseph was 30 years old, God made him a ruler in Egypt. God's made you a father in the church, but he's going to make you a ruler in Egypt. And I believe this is a year where God's making you a ruler in the community. He's making you, he's giving you authority even outside of the church. And he's going to teach you. One of the areas I saw God making you a ruler, I saw you, and this is the funniest picture I saw, because there's many ways to look like a king, but I saw you in like African tribal dress, like a tribal king. And I'm like, why is Don wearing like a green robe and a turban on his head? I don't know. But I just, I just like, there's like an African tribal kingly anointing that's coming on you. And, and I just see you dressed in like an, a regal, I, I, and you're going to, I don't know if you're going to Africa or something, but I see you like standing in front of the church and saying, like singing an African song, looking like an African guy with like a, a turban on your head and a robe on. What in the world is he doing? God, I thank you, Lord, that, that he's going he's gonna to speak to kings in Africa, God. He's going to speak to tribal kings, and he's going to go into tribal places, God. And he's going to just be a father to kings, God. He's going to teach him how to be a father to kings. Because Joseph wasn't just a ruler in Egypt. It, actually, what happened was it says, you made Joseph a father to Pharaoh. You can make him a father to Pharaoh. You can make, a father, uh, make him a father to kings. So, God, I thank you for what you've done in the church. And you know, in Jesus did a lot in the synagogue, and then when he was 30, he went out to the world, and that was when he was released to the world, and I feel like you've been a, a father in the church, but you're going to be a father in the world, so I just bless them, God, and I thank you that they've always made this a team ministry, and when God breathed into man, he didn't breathe into Adam and Eve separately, he breathed in them together, and so you put your breath, a unique breath inside of both of them, God, so God, I thank you, Lord, she can do a little African dance too, God, and she can have a little tambourine, and she can do a little, I, I feel like there's an anointing this year for freedom that's going to come uh, to you but also through you and I feel like that there's a there's an anointing for women being set free this year and I, the, I, I even see like a women's gathering or women's group a women's conference that's coming that's going to be a a, a, a a release of freedom for women and also a a, a, a symbol that there's going to be an anointing for women going and calling being called into ministry because this is going to be a church where the breath of God is not just going to be in the men but it's going to be in the women also so, Father, I thank you for that. We bless them, God. We celebrate 30 years, not just because, well, they made it. <laughs> they survived it. No way, God. They got breath in them. They got breath in them, and they got plenty of oil. And we just declare, God, that we're going to fill up their oil tanks. We're going to fill them up, God. I just pray that big old truck will never run out of gas, God. He'll just have so much gas in that, so much extra fuel, God. And even places where they're, they don't even think they're going. And I just heard, you know, Africa, and then I saw it bounce over to Australia. I just feel like there's a, even a desire in your heart to go to Australia, maybe more your wife than you, but I just feel like God's going to open up a little, you're going to go to Australia for some fun and some sun and some ministry, but mostly fun and sun, have some fun, have a little fun, just get on a surfboard, why not, try something new, you're 30 years old, you can do it. So God, I thank you. I thank you for this season, Lord. I celebrate with this church and thank you for allowing me to come and encourage them, God. Now just do me a favor. Just lift up your hands for a second to the Lord. And Father, we just thank you so much that it's not our job to grow up. You bring us to the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ, God. Lord, we grow up in all things in you because when we come together in Christ, when we come together in Christ, then we become what we're called to be. Just put your hand on the person on, on the right and the left. Did you just pray? Let's just take a moment, pray for one another. God, I pray for I pray for such a release of unity that affects this region, that the church has come together in unity. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. God, I thank you, Lord, for a, a move of unity in the Son, unity in Christ that affects this area. And Father, I thank you that as we celebrate today, as we eat, as we party, this is what you would want us to do, God. You would want us to have a wedding celebration. And you would want us to have an anniversary celebration because there's ultimately a huge celebration. It's called the Wedding Supper of the Lamb that's going to come. And we can't wait for it, God. We can't wait to sit with you and eat with you and fellowship with you. But we thank you, Father, that you have come now, that you are here that you sit and you said, if any man opens the door, I will come to him and I will sup with him. And I thank you, Father, that you wanted to have a party with us today. Lord, I bless each person. I bless what you're doing in this church. And God, I thank you 
that I get to see this beautiful bride growing up and say, what a beautiful woman of God you are. Harvest Chapel, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. I know you got to run, man. Love you, buddy. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Listen, go ahead and be seated because we have to do two things real quick because I'd be wrong not to except for Deb. Deb, come on. Uh, <laughs> I just hear this. And you can bring your team. The team can come. Um, there's some things that were said and I need to touch on because they're absolutely phenomenal. And God spoke to my heart about this. It would be an, I'd be an error not to. If you take notice, uh, as Bob was sharing, he mentioned something about having two pairs of shoes, a pair of black shoes and a pair of running shoes. Remember him saying that? Anybody take notice to the shoes he was wearing? Because they weren't black, they were silver. And, uh, and I began looking at those, and I thought, wow, silver. And the Lord spoke to me and said, silver is redemption. If you study history, the silver cup was the cup of redemption. I won't get into all that right now. But I heard the Lord speak this, and I'd be amiss if we didn't do this right now. Re to redeem means to bring it back, to buy it back, to get back. It's so in my heart right now, and I just really, I, I heard God very clearly. I know that we're going out to celebrate. We have all kind of reasons to celebrate. This is a great day to celebrate, and we'll, we'll celebrate all day. We'll have a great time. But I heard the Lord say this, that this is a great time right now to get it back. You were healthy, and sickness came. It's time to get your health back. You were financially sound. Trials came. It's time to get your finances back. Your children were doing good, and the devil came in and has messed with their lives. It's time to get your kids back. I'm telling you, I saw that in those shoes. Blessed are the feet of those who preach good tidings. Those feet, those shoes, when, when they kept glaring in my eyes and I couldn't miss that. I, I knew that God was in that. I need to do something right now. I just feel God in this. I need, I need some regional pastors. Would you guys come forward? The ministry staff. I just need you guys right now because I hear God in this real clear. And I know it's Him. I just know it's Him. I don't need a whole lot of folks because I don't think it's just a a large thing, but I do think this. I think I think there's something special about the day right now, and I don't want you to miss what God wants to do. And it would be a miss if we didn't pray into this, but I really believe this is an hour for somebody. I believe it's an hour for somebody. Can I say this? You had incredible peace, and you've lost your peace. It's time to get your peace back. It's time to get your peace back. And I want to say this. I hear this real clear. Your peace is not depending on somebody else's response. Your peace is not dependent on how somebody else thinks or says or does. Your peace has absolutely nothing to do with their response and everything to do with yours to him. Man, I hear that. It's time to get your peace back. It's time to get your health back. It's time to get your joy back. You've lost your joy. If you've lost your joy, this is a good day to get your joy back. Because it's hard to celebrate when you don't have your joy back. Get your joy back. It's time to get your joy back. God's in the midst of this thing. Man, I feel this. I could, burr. I feel this strong right now. But it's an hour right now. We're going to go after this thing. If you're here this morning and, man, it is in your heart, you're saying, I, I want to get it back. I want to get it back. I, I know we could preach 1 Samuel 30 and Ziklag and David and taking back what the devil stole and pursue. You'll recover all. But I'm just here to tell you this. This is about you right now. Taken back, getting back, getting it back. There's this redemption. Those silver shoes, they're, they're, the, the picture of that, I can't get it out of my mind. They're that strong. Silver shoes. Maybe some of you need to get it back. Come and get your silver shoes on. But I'm telling you, this is a great time right now. I'm just convinced. If you've been sick in your body recently and it's time to get your health back, man, I'd, I'd get up here right away. If you've got some trouble in your family, I'd get up here right away. If you've got some financial struggle, I'd get up here right away. But I'm telling you, this is a time right now. This is a time. I just know this. I know I'm hearing God as clear as I've ever heard him. Start to sing something real spiritual because I'm telling you, God, it's in his place. It's time right now. It's time to get it back. It's time. It's time. Ryan, come and help me, man, if you can. It's time right now just to believe God. It's time right now just to believe God. 
it's time right now. These are silver shoes. These are silver shoes. Some of you are about to put some silver shoes on. Some of you are about to get some silver shoes. I, I need about 10 more people to help me pray. Sue, it's in your heart. Come on. I, I'm just ready to believe God right now. This is a moment. This is an hour right now where you can just step out and believe God and trust and believe. This is a time right now where God wants to move, where God's going to do something amazing. It's time for you in your silver shoes. It's time to put on those silver shoes and believe God right now. This is a moment. This is a moment ordained in heaven. Trust God in that. Trust God in that. Go ahead, Deb. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory.
become more aware of your presence.